Hello, True Health Seekers, and welcome to another exciting episode of the Learn True Health podcast. I'm really, really excited for you to hear today's interview with Dr. Michael Biamonte. It is mind-blowing. This is going to be one of those interviews, you know, once in a while. I've done, I definitely have done a, a, several, several interviews that are life-changing, and this is one of them. You know, sometimes I've got some feel-good health interviews and, and mental health, emotional health, that kind of stuff, spiritual health. This is the one where rubber hits the road and I know that we're on to something with his protocol. I'm really excited to dive in and excited for you guys to hear how you can finally get rid of that elusive candida, which it sounds like is a major contributor to many illnesses that people continue to suffer from and they're, they're it's like it's just like playing darts in the dark you just you keep you keep trying different things taking different supplements changing diets eliminating i know some people who uh they can hardly eat anything they've eliminated so many foods and yet they're always so sick and candida is the root cause it's just amazing how uh, so many people are walking around suffering from a candida infection. And here we have today the information that is going to change their life. So I'm very excited for you to hear today's interview. I want you to plug in with the Learn Trail podcast to make sure that you don't miss out on any more life-changing interviews. Please, of course, subscribe to wherever you listen, like Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Podbean, uh, even the the podcast app on your phone, whether it's Android or iPhone you can also come to LearnTrueHealth.com. I spent all summer long revamping the website, and so it looks fantastic. It's much more mobile-friendly. Please come to the website, LearnTrueHealth.com, and pour through great information there. I also transcribe every interview to make sure that you can get the information you need so that all the content is searchable on the website. So you can use the search function if you're looking for, let's say, you're like, I want to I want to learn more about detox or heavy metals. You can type in mercury or heavy metals or detox in the search function. Every episode where we talk about that and teach about it is going to show up for you. Also, I know that there's some people who like to take notes or like to read instead of listen to the show, and that's why the transcripts are there for you, and they are all at LearnTrueHealth.com. Now, uh, many of you are not on Facebook, uh, but I encourage you to come join just to get into the Facebook group, and for those who are on Facebook and are not in the group already, I, I invite you to come check it out and be part of our community because you're really missing out if you're not part of the Learn True Health Facebook group. We've got over 5,000 listeners in there. And together, we answer each other's questions. We learn from each other. We share e our successes with each other. It's a very supportive environment. I have learned so much, and I've also shared. I answer all the questions I can, and I help to bring all my expertise and all my knowledge from all the guests that I've interviewed and all the naturopathic physicians that have mentored me for the last 11-plus years. Uh, I bring all that to the table, and I help as much as I can. But, you know, we also have experts in that uh, in that Facebook group. We have some of our past guests in the Facebook group. They'll show up and answer questions as well. And we have naturopathic physicians. And I'm just, I'm so pleased that we have such a wonderful community of health nuts, just like myself, there to show up and to help each other. And so whether you're brand new to the holistic space and you're looking to finally get your health back, or whether you're an avid longtime listener, or longtime advocate for holistic health, you're going to love the Learn Your Health Facebook group. It's free. Come join it and, and just experience that either you could be someone who helps or you could be someone that receives the help or, or both. And, and that's what I think is such an enriching, that's why it's such an enriching environment. So please subscribe. I have a bunch of really great interviews coming out this month that I'm really excited for you to hear them. And I want to make sure that you continue to get access to my interviews. Uh, make sure you come to LearnTrueHealth.com, my website, and check it out. Use the search function. Take advantage of all the features that I've added to it. And come join the Facebook group, the Learn True Health Facebook group. You can find it by going to LearnTrueHealth.com slash group. That's LearnTrueHealth.com slash group. Now, this episode I know is going to make a huge difference in people's lives, so please share it with any of your friends that have eczema, that have chronic health issues that don't seem to resolve, that have chronic gut issues that don't seem to resolve. This is definitely the interview that's going to help them. 
I'm really excited though for the next few interviews I have planned out that I'm I'm uh, going to be releasing soon. So definitely stay tuned because this one's amazing and the next few are equally as amazing. I'm so excited. I hope you guys are having a wonderful, wonderful month. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much for sharing. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for coming into the Facebook group and sharing your testimonials of how the Learn to Health podcast has made a difference in your life. There was recently uh, an, a testimonial that left me absolutely in tears in, in a good way. And actually, I think what I'm going to do, because it is such a good testimonial, I think I'm, I'm going to read it uh, out loud soon in, a, um, in an episode because I feel that it is, it is worth everyone hearing it. And just spoiler alert, some of the information that she got from my show helped her save her mom's life. So how cool is that? I, you know, when I set out to do this podcast, it was to help people no longer suffer like I had suffered. And it was to help people if we could save someone's mom or save someone's dad from dying of cancer or heart disease, or, you know, if we could prevent illness, if we could stop suffering and prevent illness in other people's lives, then that then mission accomplished. And I love getting your testimonials because that's, that, that's the fuel. That's the fuel that keeps me doing this because I want to help as many people as possible to learn your health. I want to stop the suffering as, of as many people as possible and help as many people as possible to save their loved ones. So together by sharing this, you are helping to do that. You're, you're on board with my mission to help as many people as possible. So thank you for spreading this information by sharing my podcast with those you care about because we are really making a difference. When we get testimonials like that, that, that is why I do it. And that is why, and, and so I know that's why you share it as well because if you can share with a friend and, and they're able to resolve their chronic illness from the information you shared, that is that is better than any Christmas gift or any birthday gift or that's any any gift you could ever receive. That is the best gift to give to give someone the gift of knowledge that they apply that then allows them to no longer suffer. That is I mean, touching someone's life in that way feels so good. So thank you for helping me to spread this information. And you're part of that. You're part of helping people to get out and end suffering, get out of suffering and start feeling amazing and living lives that are full. So thank you. Awesome. Enjoy today's episode. I know you're going to love it because with Dr. Biamonte's protocol, we're going to help a lot of people. And I'm very excited about that. Welcome to the Learn True Health podcast. I'm your host, Ashley James. This is episode 488. I am so excited for today's guest. We have back on the show for part two of uh, the Candida Chronicles. We're just diving deep into the gut today. And we have listener questions because we just published recently our first part of our interview. And now we're, we're going deep. And I'm so excited to have you back on the show, Dr. Michael Biamonte. We have we've fa- a fantastic questions from the listeners, but first, um, I want to pick up where we left off. We were talking about your your Candida protocol, and for for listeners who haven't heard our first episode, we definitely want to go back to episode four eighty six so that they can hear the, the first part where we talked about how. Dr. Biamonte came about uh, understanding candida on on such a deep, deep level and how to finally resolve it because it is a very elusive beast. And so I'm so happy that we're finally digging into the meat today. So let's just pick up where we left off. You were talking about the treatments that work and that you see really work and that you have even before you even start treatments, you sort of have a a pre-treatment protocol. Can we get into that? Sure. We start typically with phase zero, and the program runs phase zero, one, two, three, and four. And what I, one of the major discoveries that I made in handling candida was that you needed to do certain things in a certain order, and if you violated the order, it wasn't going to work. So the first phase that we have, phase zero, is uh, like a preparatory phase in a sense where it is like a colon cleanse for someone with parasites and candida or let's just say dysbiosis. 
And what that phase essentially does is it removes any of the major organisms that are hanging out there that if we try to kill them with the latter phases would just create so much die off that it would make it intolerable for the person. Mm. So phase zero gets rid of, because phase zero works mechanically. The products that we use in phase zero destroy candida enzymatically by digesting it using diatomaceous earth, which, which slashes into it. And by using herbal and fiber products, which sort of scrub, scrub it and get it to re release off the lining of your intestine, which is a very tricky thing with parasites and candida because they make certain proteins that lock themselves onto the lining of your intestine. And then there's the biofilm that's there too. Mm -hmm. So f phase zero neutralizes all those things so that the organisms that are easily accessible are, are being able to mechanically be drawn out, which is another thing that the two of the phase zero products in particular mechanically draw out candida and, and harmful organisms that are kind of living in the creases of your intestinal tract. We talked about biofilm a little bit in our last, um, in the part one of this interview. So biofilm, I guess I keep seeing it in those colon cleansing parasite groups where people take a picture of this long, weird thing that's not quite a worm, but looks like this really, it looks like um, they shed something that molded, it was like a perfect mold of their intestines. Well, that's not, no, that's not biofilm. What that, that's considered to be hardened feces, hardened mm. feces and hardened mucus which has stagnated in the intestinal tract. And you don't find that in everybody. Dr. Jensen's book, Bowel Management, I think it was colon cleansing through bowel management, no, tissue cleansing through bowel management. That book had many, many pictures of people who had been very constipated, who excreted this black rubbery material that was literally like a mold of the intestinal tract. That's not typical. That's in more extreme cases. The average person doesn't have that. The average person would have, will have biofilm. Biofilm is produced by, typically by Marcon uh, bacteria. Marcons are bacteria which are unfortunately drug resistive and have become antibiotic resistive. And these Marcons are uh, various, they're in the family of Mercer and mm. these types of bacteria. These Marcons produce this mucus-like substance that they hide in. And unfortunately, the way organisms work, bad organisms work, is they, they cluster together. So if you have candida, you can be guaranteed that in the area of your intestinal tract where the candida is living, marcons are going to find their way. They're going to become attracted to that candida, as will protozoa and other harmful pathogens. They'll all get sort of um, stuck together. And then the marcons produce the biofilm, which is like a slime that they get covered in. This is before, until we learned about marcons and biofilm, it made it harder to get rid of these microorganisms. But the, the advent of technology on biofilm has made it much easier because we know that the average person who's doing any kind of a, a, like a, a cleansing program to try to get rid of candida or parasites, if they have a lot of biofilm, you have to cut through that biofilm for those products to be able to reach those organisms. That's an, we now know that's essential. But it is typical that people who have biofilm, you touched on this before a little, people who have biofilm typically will excrete mucus. That's one of the ways we know that it's, they have biofilm and the, the product to get rid of the biofilm is working. They'll call and they'll say, you know, I, I pooped before and it was really slimy. Mm. And that's an indicator. That's an indicator. So that's what phase zero of our program. I'm hearing how important phase zero is because I know so many people who will jump into a cle you know, quote unquote cleanse. They'll go to the health food store, they'll buy some something with a bunch of herbs in it and, and then they'll just start taking it and they'll end up feeling horrible horrible right because there's a big die-off but they're not addressing the um the the hood the the neighborhood in, <laughs> that the, that inside the gut where the uh the candida has set up shop basically within this biofilm and as long as we're keeping the biofilm in there 
then it can hide inside us and yeah. you know, can avoid these these protozoa, these bacteria, these bad bacteria, the the candida. They all hide together in their little bunker that they've created inside our gut. It's pretty a pretty accurate picture. Phase zero was originally developed when I was doing some work with Holda Clark, mm. who who wrote who wrote a lot of popular books. And she made me aware of just how common parasites were in a lot of my patients. So the original phase zero was a parasite cleanse. And then we discovered that the, the phase zero was also busting up biofilm and doing all these other things. And we discovered that the people who did phase zero before they went on to the other phases that we had, had less die off. So then we decided to extend phase zero. We gave the, gave the person phase zero for the first month and then after that, the person continued phase zero along with uh, phase one and phase two, which are the two major killing or elimination phases. And the die-off was less in those people than if they not, did not take the, the uh, phase zero. But, but that's still all relative because if you have somebody with bad leaky gut, people with leaky gut get very bad die-off as well mm -hmm. because the nature of the leaky gut allows all those dead, those dead toxins from the organisms you're killing just to spill into the, blood, the bloodstream and overload it and cause, some, cause mass cell activation. So, but it still is less. if you Phase zero still does cut back the die-off the person is bound to have. That's the, kind of the bottom line, and that's where, why phase zero is useful. Because it does lower the dye off and it does continually act like an ongoing colon cleanse so that as the person is taking phase one and phase two, the phase zero allows them to get deeper and deeper and deeper and make, and they just make it work better. It's just very synergistic. I love it. And can you just back up for those that don't know what die off, when we say die off, what we're referring to, could you please explain the, the, like the mechanism in the body of die off? Sure. Die off is technically referred to as Herxheimer reaction because it was Dr. Dr. Herxheimer who identified die off. He, he, he uh, had found that when he treated people for Lyme disease and parasites and things like that, they had a bad reaction, like a toxic or an allergic reaction that was generated by the dead organisms. So if you give somebody uh, some kind of antimicrobial, it goes into their system, it kills the candida, it kills the bacteria, it kills the yeast, whatever. Now you have this dead organism there, dead debris. The dead debris starts to denature. There's a, a, a lysis that occurs, which means the cells break down and they split, and it's decomposing essentially. So you have decomposing bad dead microorganisms in your gut that release all kinds of toxins and antigens and uh, harmful toxic proteins and whatnot. They can even release viruses. Um, wow. Candida, candida and, and certain parasites harbor viruses. They themselves are the carrier of a virus. So this is why you'll get some people with herpes. When they do a candida cleanse or a parasite cleanse, their herpes will get worse temporarily. And that's because the, the killing those organisms are releasing, you're killing the host and that's releasing the virus from the from the um, the that host, which is the organ the microorganism. So that's what die off is basically. Die off is basically an allergic reaction that one has to the dead organisms mm. they're killing on their cleansing program. Right, the the mycotoxins and just all all of it. Doctor J Davidson was on our show and he talked about how parasites can almost be like sponges for heavy metals, and that when we they die off, they end up releasing heavy metals right back into the, 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 the body. And, and the same thing is true of candida. And that's a very dangerous concept because it's mm. caused, it's caused some people and some practitioners who were practitioners who were very intelligent to be misled into thinking that candida or parasites actually are a protective mechanism of the body to entrap these heavy metals, mm -hmm. which is totally false. It's completely false. And the major reason why I can say it's false that we can easily um, look at is the fact that heavy metals, especially mercury, suppress fecal Ig, IgE and IgA. They, the mercury depresses your intestinal immune system. It suppresses your intestinal immune system. That's what allows candida and parasites to even flourish more, is that due to the presence of mercury, your own intestinal immune system is suppressed. This, I mean, this is such a strong point to make that um, if the, the parasites are mopping up mercury, for example, and then they die off, they're releasing the mercury, which is suppressing the immune system, which is allowing things like candida to, to overtake it. Does candida itself also 
mop up or or hold on to the these heavy metals or what is it what is candida release when it dies candida can release and can ac- accumulate all heavy metals okay. and this is why this is again why you've got to eliminate candida in a specific order and you have to mm-hmm. know that it does this because when you put somebody on a program to kill candida if you don't have them on things that are also binders which my phase zero program covers that are going to absorb the mercury or the heavy metals, then you're just throwing those metals back into their system. And we're definitely going to, I want to talk more about the products that you've figured out work. We're definitely going to talk about that. I'd like to also address food because you've talked about constipation. And I wonder, um, do people with constipation have uh, greater chances of candida or do people with diarrhea, uh, do people on either side of the spectrum when it comes to bowel movements, um, have candida issues or does candida end up causing constipation or diarrhea? Actually, both are true. If you're, if you're fine and not having any issue and you suddenly get candida, it will constipate you. Mm. It can cause diarrhea, but mostly it will constipate you. Um, but on the other hand, if you're, if you're prone to constipation for whatever reason or you suddenly get it, the constipation will cause you to develop candida because constipation causes your bowels to become more alkaline. And candida lives in an alkaline environment in your intestinal tract. And this is really interesting. That was actually one of the questions our listeners uh, brought up in, the, in our Learn Trail Facebook group. Uh, the idea that that it that it uh, flourishes in an alkaline environment because you know everyone's running around drinking alkaline water and saying we should alkalize our body, but there's areas of the body where we want it to be acidic for a reason as part of our well, defense mechanism. Right, we have to separate this out. This is where a little knowledge becomes dangerous. Mm. The P, the pH of the intestinal tract, a, a normal good pH for your intestines, is somewhere between six and seven point two. When you go higher than 7.2, the acidophilus there dies, the probiotics die, and then candida takes over. When you go below 6, you have other parts of your normal flora which die, and then it's very easy to have organisms that would cause diarrhea to take over. So an alkaline colon tends to be constipated, an acid colon tends to be diarrhea. In the middle is where we want to be because that's where the pH is correct for all your normal flora to live. And there is also a large majority of the normal flora is E. coli. Now, when I say E. coli, people are th- right away, th- they're thinking of hamburger that's putrefying and that's going to be poisonous. But the large, the large majority of your normal gram-negative bacteria in your intestinal tract is an, uh, sort of a friendly E. coli, which is, ne- which is non-pathogenic. You can even buy it in supplements in Europe, in Germany, and other countries there. You can buy E. coli supplements just like you were buying acidophilus. They don't allow that here in this country because they, they would be very concerned about whether or not the E. coli you're getting is the right strain or is it a pathogenic strain, so the FDA just doesn't allow it. Mm-hmm. But we need the healthy E. coli? Yes, we do. That's a, it's a, the majority of your, of, your, of your bacteria in your intestinal tract actually is the healthy E. coli. It's not even the healthy gram-positive acidophilus and bifidus. The healthy E. coli outnumbers those. It, when we're doing phase zero and someone, let's say, is either they have diarrhea or they have constipation, what f- and they're doing the protocol to bind and to get rid of the biofilm and all that, what foods are the best foods to support this program? You know what? It's funny. When it comes to candida, there is no food that helps you get rid of candida. There are only foods that make it worse. <laughs> so just don't feed it. Right. It's, that's really the simplest answer. There is no food that really gets rid of candida. When we really cut down to the nitty-gritty of it, there isn't really any food or any diet that's going to get rid of candida. Even if you go on a really low-carb diet that's high in vegetables and high in all these, these beneficial foods, you're still not going to get rid of the candida because mm. the candida has grown roots into your tiny capillaries in your intestinal tract to siphon off glucose to keep itself alive. Oh, my gosh. So you're not going to get rid of it. But an ideal diet for candida would include um, organic, non-GMO, grass-fed meat and animal products. It would include a high amount of vegetables. It would be low in carb and low in sugar. It would be also very low in grain and gluten-free. Mm-hmm. That would be the essential 
makeup of a diet that would be helpful to somebody with dysbiosis. And, and on an individual level, they also, it's important that they avoid foods they know they're allergic to, that they see they have reactions to, or, the, or maybe show up on an allergy test that they're, rea they're reacting to. That would be important too. So have you seen, um, I know, you, I'm going to ask the question just a little bit differently, but you did answer it. Uh, so I am asking the question again, but slightly different. The, the certain diets uh, claim to heal the gut like the GAPS diet, for example, that has a lot of bone broth. Are, do you see benefit in when it comes to treating candida and healing the gut? Have you seen a benefit to specific diets that aim to heal the gut? Some. Again, it's kind of more important what you don't do than what you do. Mm. And, when, and when it comes to healing the gut, raw food, believe it or not, raw salads, raw vegetables are actually harmful. Mm -hmm. They, they ir further irritate a leaky gut. And fermented food also further irritates the leaky gut. So on the leaky gut diets that I give my patients there, the first thing we're concerned about is they're not eating fermented foods, they're not eating a lot of raw foods. And of course, because almost everyone with leaky gut has candida, you also want to make sure the diet is low in carb and low in sugar. Mm -hmm. But the carbohydrates from vegetables is okay, but you're saying maybe like remove fruit? Fru yeah, because fruit is more of a refined sugar. Fructose and fruit juice and things like this get absorbed into your bloodstream and in your body too quickly because you're separating the, the fiber from the, the sugar. When you, like as an example, when you make a juice, um, that's a, a great example. But when you eat fruit, your body eventually separates out the, the sugars from the fibers and those, the fructose is pretty volatile. It does aggravate candida, regardless of what some people out there say. I have a we had a we had a patient who went went wacko once, um, at, on, by with this concept that fruit would would not be a good sugar to eat, or fruit would be bad for candida. Um, but anyway, so um, the fruit is bad for candida because it is mm -hmm. sugar. Lactose is bad for candida. Maltose is bad for candida. Sucrose is bad. Any, just about anything that's sweet. Uh, Twenty years ago, we found that a lot of the alcohol sugars, like mannitol, xylitol, mm -hmm. um, these sugars were not really affecting candida patients. And it just happened to be we've noticed in the last few years that people who eat these sugars are now reacting, oh. or their candida is. And we've been, I've been scrounging, trying to find data, trying to find evidence from somewhere that in some university where someone is now be, is able to prove that candida has genetically, let's say, morphed to where it can now feed off alcohol sugars, but I haven't been able to find anything. I can only say that I hear more complaints from patients when they try to eat these, um, the, that we used to, we, they would be called low impact carbs. Mm -hmm. People are reacting to them now where they didn't 10, 15 years ago. But I think a general rule is anything that you anything that you taste that's sweet is going to be bad for a candida program. Yeah. We're using food as medicine. So uh, these foods, like fruit is healthy for people who don't have candida, right? Yes, Get rid of the is. candida. You can start eating fruit again as long as you don't redevelop candida. Exactly. So it's not that, it's not that fruit true. is bad. It's that it, this is, we're really looking to use food as medicine. This is therapeutic. This is yes. a therapeutic use of food specifically right. for an individual case. And so someone who, who's a, an apple farmer should not be offended by what I'm saying. This just happens to be the science. And this is only, as you're saying, it's only temporary. It doesn't mean you can never again eat the fruit, but right. you have to get your flora back so that you don't end up, end up feeding these bad sugar-dependent organisms who are out to give you trouble. I wonder about the, the anti-candida diet, and we're starving the candida, but all at the same time, are we also starving all the good stuff that's kind of also keeping it at bay? There's that fine balance. To a degree, because sugars do feed friendly bacteria. There are sugars, certain sugars, that are found in certain foods, and just right off the top of my head, artichokes and bananas are mm -hmm. very high in sugars, which, which very, um, very often feed friendly bacteria without overfeeding bad organisms. Although fructooligosaccharide, FOS, which is a popular product, can feed harmful bacteria. So when you use it, you have to be careful because if you have a bacteria like Klebsiella, let's say, in your system, which is a, a bacteria that causes a lot of autoimmune illness, if you take FOS, you're going to feed the Klebsiella and make it, and make it uh, grow. 
So you need to be careful with this. But to a degree, you're correct. There are certain sugars and things which do help feed the friendly guys. It's kind of a, a war of attrition, this whole subject matter we're talking about. We need to put a diet together that's going to starve the candida long enough for the supplements and the other, um, let's say, products that we take to kill it. Mm -hmm. And then once we get the candida low enough, then we need to reestablish the probiotics by giving the intestinal tract the prebiotics, which are the different foods that help feed the probiotics so they can grow back. Mm -hmm. This is a very complicated garden that we are we are balancing in, within us. So there's there. I love that you have these phases because it we really need to take that seriously. The idea of phase one, phase two, or phase zero. So we, we've discussed phase zero, and um, I want to talk about different phases. And I want to talk about the products that that you that you recommend that you that you've created or or uh, I've seen really work. Um, so phase zero being incredibly important, they do it for a month. Are there times when someone would do it for longer than a month or do, if they have certain symptoms, they do it for longer or well, a phase, month is su phase zero is continued with phase one and phase two. Okay. So Got that, it. that so would they, be my, that's my first answer. Okay, good. So after a month, they add phase one. So what does phase yes. one look like? Phase one is typically four to, to five. Um, naturopathic or herbal antifungals that I choose based on the testing I do on the person. And they rotate these every four days. So and the tip, most typically it would be four items. They take four days each. That would mean it would be 16 days for them to go through the cycle once. And normally we have them go through the cycle twice before we speak to them or retest them to see how much they've killed off with phase one. Mm-hmm. And the herbals that we choose on phase one work systemically. They absorb into your blood and your lymphatic system and kill candida there as well as killing it in the intestinal tract. That phase right. typically, typically will last two to three months. And we, okay. we know when they're finished because the urine test that we do on them has a certain reaction when they're finished with that phase. And that tells us they're ready to go to phase two which is probably the most important of the phases in a way mm. because on phase two, we use fatty acid-based antifungals, which are able to absorb into the intestinal lining and kill the candida at its roots. It's, that is the very candida we're killing on phase two, which prevents the probiotics from coming back. And here, right here, there's a little microcosm of why all the people out there who are self-treating are constantly failing. Mm -hmm. they, they don't know categorically which antifungals would fit into a phase zero, phase one, or phase two. So they just have everything thrown together. In Yiddish, the word is unga pachka, everything <laughs> thrown together. So they don't know specifically to select the antifungals for phase two that are going to be able to kill that candida that's blocking their probiotics from coming back. But you see, even if they knew the products and tried them, it still wouldn't work because they hadn't done phase zero and phase one yet. Right. Right. How, how long through trial and error, and this is why they call it practicing medicine, how long did this take you to, to dial in? Uh, let's see. Um, I started researching this in 1986, 87, and we had, a basic, we had a basic framework in about 1992 or 1993. Um, a, lot, a lot of the research took off when I met Scott Gregory, who was the author of a book called The Holistic Protocol for the Immune System. He helped, he helped a lot. We shared ideas to put together this because he had a basic structure. He had, a, he had the concept of phase one. Phase, phase one would be killing the organisms. Phase two would be detoxing the body. And phase three would be putting nutrients that are essential back in. And phase four would be boosting the immune system. That was the the skeleton he had. And you can still buy the book. The book is out there. It's called The Holistic Protocol for the Immune System by Dr. Scott Gregory. So he gave me a basic map. And, I, and from that, I was able to full, fill in all the empty spaces and also include the correct testing that would go with each phase because he didn't have anything on testing. And the testing is very important because you don't know when to stop the phase. You don't know when the phase is, has reached its, um, its end phenomena if you don't have some kind of test to say, well, is this now complete? Is the, is the action we're carrying on complete? You have to have that, mm -hmm. otherwise it's not scientific. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, we, we, we want to be pragmatic about it and, 
Yes, I love this idea, the phase two, the fatty acid based antifungals, so that then we're preparing the way for the for those good bacteria to come in and proliferate and and um, like soldiers not allow for the candida not giving the space for the candida to come back so when how do you know when phase two is done when phase two is over the person no longer has die off from these these um, antifungals and the on the urine test that we do well, the candida levels have reached a certain point they've dropped down to a certain point that we know we can now give the probiotics and the probiotics will work. And uh, fa is that phase three? The, no, you said phase three was Well, the... phase two, we split. We split into three okay. sections. There's the first part of phase two that everybody would do that has these antifungals we're talking about. Then there's potentially the leaky gut section where the person would then heal leaky gut. And then the probiotic section would be last. This is because people who have leaky gut tend to have bad reactions to probiotics. So we, we never give probiotics to people who have leaky gut. They have to handle their leaky gut mm -hmm. first, and then mm -hmm. we give them the probiotics. Then when they go on the probiotics, normally they will have bloating and gas for about three to four weeks, and then the bloating and gas goes away. That's actually a sign that the probiotics are, are replicating, and they're killing off or fermenting any remaining harmful organisms. The, also, the urine test that we do on them has a very, very particular reaction that it does when those probiotics have come back. Now, if we, if we reach two or three months, let's say, on the probiotics, and the person's still having bloating and gas, and the urine test hasn't reacted in that way that we're looking, we know we need to go back to um, phase two, part A, back to those fatty acid-based antifungals and do more killing. Now, what about small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or fungal overgrowth? Um, is that a concern through this? Uh, well, everyone with candida has it. There's, there are, there, there, it's become, a, in the last few months, I think, like a little bit of a, a kitschy thing that mm -hmm. they're talking about, but it's really nothing, it's nothing new to me. Um, it's existed as long as I've been researching candida, and there's nothing special we do about it. We just follow our typical protocol, and that goes away. I think there's some, somebody in a lab someplace Notice that the small intestine may get uh, candida overgrowth as well as the colon, and he decided to try to turn this into some kind of a, a new thing. It's actually nothing new, and I really don't, <laughs> don't have very much to say about it other than it's what else is new. <laughs> How do you know that your patient has leaky gut? What tests prove that? We do a test that's, that's done by a lab uh, called Metasol. It's a breath test. And for years, I've been searching for tests for leaky gut. The original one we did, which everyone did, was called the lactulose mannitol recovery test, where you have the patient drink a small bottle of lactulose and mannitol, and then you, you collect their urine and you see how much they absorbed and how much they peed out. That would tell mm -hmm. you if they had leaky gut. Mm -hmm. now, now, nowadays, we have the zonulin test, which is very good, which tells us about the, the integrity of the brush border cells. That's a very good test. Um, and it's been, it, they're including it now in certain stool tests. Of course, you can have it done as a blood test. But I have found that sometimes it's a little bit iffy. The best results I've had have been with this breath test. The, 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 the lab can actually tell us if the person has leaky gut based on the gases that are in the person's breath. And I have found that to be, from trial and error, what, using all these tests, that so far has been the one that's the most reliable. Oh, so fascinating. Now, yeah, keep, in, keep something in mind here. This is, um, and this is a, a very important point, is when we do these tests, we follow up with them. Mm -hmm. here, this is where, unfortunately, a lot of practitioners and a lot of patients get, become very sloppy. We do a test on someone. We find they have leaky gut. They go on the program for leaky gut. And when we feel that they've improved significantly enough, we retest them so that we have actual proof the leaky gut is gone. And if you don't do that, your whole program is going to be very sloppy and you're not going to be really assured of what direction and what's happening because you don't really know. You're guessing. You're guessing your leaky gut is gone because this main symptom I had of the pimple on my nose hurting every time I ate this food went away. Well, that's not scientific. 
because you can have other reasons why that's happening. We've had people who've done the leaky gut test. They were positive. They went on the leaky gut program. They got better to some degree. We repeated the test. The leaky gut was gone. And they said, it can't be because I still have this symptom. Well, we end up finding out that symptom is caused by something else and not leaky gut. You got to get away from opinionated subjective uh, concepts, and you have to think more objectively if you're really going to get a result. It's good to know your body and listen to your symptoms, but it's it's not good to just decide that those symptoms are caused by this without doing any follow-up tests and, and proving it. And I, I love your program because you're checking in with the body and what's happening in the gut throughout the program so that you can make the most informed decision as to what's best next. My mom was on the anti-candida diet for half her life, you know, oh and girl. I bet people get stuck, right? They do a test, they go to a practitioner, they do a test, they say they're, they, 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 they leaky gut, and then they end up eating for years and years and years like the leaky gut program without completing it, without getting like to the final phase, right? And, and getting true health, like getting to the other side. They just get stuck in a cycle of, of just having to eat a certain way or take a bunch of herbs without completing it. So I, I really love that you are, are so pragmatic about this. You've got to be objective and subjective. You have to know yeah. when to use both and when they fit in. So at what point is phase two complete and then what's phase three look like? Well, phase two is complete when we have the flora restored. And as I said, the evidence that the flora is restored is usually they'll go through a period of a few weeks when they're on the correct flora program mm -hmm. where they'll have bloating and gas. The bloating and gas will go away. With the, there's that particular reaction in the urine test that we're looking for. Mm -hmm. That occurs. We know they're cool. Now, the next thing, the very first thing we do on phase three is we do a hair and mineral analysis and we do a test called the organics test. Mm -hmm. And the reason why we do these two tests is because the organics test will tell us if they're being exposed to any kind of chemical toxicity and how they'll also tell us how well they detoxify. It also has a GI panel that looks for arabinol and some other organic acids, which will further confirm the candida is gone. And then we look at the hair analysis for toxic metals. So if we find any toxicity, if we find toxic metals, toxic chemicals, anything like this in the person, then we either can do some further testing to identify exactly what it is, or if we feel like we have the data and we know what it is, then we put them on a program to detoxify the metals or the chemicals or the molds or whatever it is we happen to find. Once, once we do that, which can last quite a few months, depending on what the person has, it could be five to six months easy to get rid of the metals. Once mm -hmm. we have that done, then we repeat those tests to, uh, to, to verify and confirm that the toxicity is gone. And now we look at their balance of nutrients in the body. We look at all their amino acids. We look at their hormones. We look at their vitamins. We look at their minerals. We look at their fatty acids, we, et cetera. We look at virtually every nutrient in the person's body and look to see what we need to do now to rebalance that and get that into a normal level. And when that's done, that's the end of phase three, and then we can look at them from a phase four viewpoint. A phase four, the phase four, we're dealing with strictly with the immune system. And if the person, and this again goes back to what I was saying about the order you do things in, if you're going to try to handle somebody's immune system while they still have toxic metals, you're going to fail. If you're going to try to handle somebody's immune system while they, while they still have improper adrenal or thyroid function, you're going to fail. If you're going to try to handle their immune system while their liver or their insulin levels are still off, you're going to fail. If you're going to try to handle the immune system while the person's deficient in testosterone or DHEA or they have high cortisol, you're going to fail. So all of those things have to be handled on phase three first before we touch their immune system. I just, this thought came to mind, this would be an amazing program for those who are choosing to battle cancer um, in a holistic way to go. Th this would be perfect for them to go through because all these things you've mentioned are causing the immune system to, to just go like be totally drained and totally focused on these things instead of actually beating the cancer. I, I would agree with you. You do have genetic factors when, you, when it comes to cancer and even candida. There are genetics that make people more prone to candida. There are certain SNPs 
that actually make a person much more prone to candida than not. And of course, with cancer, we know that cancer and looking at the genes that are involved in cancer is an absolutely fascinating study and very, very, very um, warranted. And what's even more interesting is when you're studying genetics is when you you look at the genes and then you get a, a, a physiologist who is well-schooled in nutrition and herbology and things, and they're able to look at those genes and they're able to actually tell you what nutrients or what herbs are good in trying to control that gene from manifesting and doing its damage. Mm. That's the, that, to me, that's the future mm -hmm. of a lot of medicine is looking at somebody's genes and then putting them on a program where they actually are taking nutrients that are going to try to control the aberration that the gene may, may, may cause. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the epigenetic expressions being affected by uh, levels of toxicity or or uh, lack of nutrients. So that I mean, what you're doing is perfect for that because you're looking at the body holistically, but you're going about it in the correct order. You mentioned how in phase three you're looking at the balance of nutrients and hormones, and it just it occurs to me: does does having a chronic candida infection affect, or how does it affect our hormones? Um, candida is very estrogenic. So if you have candida, you're going to become estrogen dominant. It may not show them in your lab work, but it's going to happen with your estrogen receptor sites. So you're going to manifest being estrogen dominant. If a man has candida, he's going to have low testosterone. Mm -hmm. Generally, people who have candida have elevated cortisol. Mm -hmm. So their, their body's in a higher state of stress, which is that fight or flight. So they're less likely to be in that rest and digest healing mode right. as well. And then the biggest one is thyroid. This is why uh, when you, if you do a search for me on the internet, you're going to find that I have websites that are really related to and dedicated to candida. But I also have a website that's called the New York City Thyroid Doctor because candida affects your thyroid and if you don't if a doctor doesn't understand the relationship between candida and thyroid and if he doesn't understand the relationship between toxins and toxic metals and thyroid and if he doesn't understand the relationship between trace minerals and thyroid he's not going to get the optimal result when he's trying to correct someone's thyroid function those are three those are three areas we cover on that website that the average um practitioner who deals with thyroid has no clue about. I actually mm -hmm. laugh about it when patients will tell me, I went to this thyroid specialist on Park Avenue and he's one of the greatest in the world and blah, blah, blah. And I'll ask him, I say, well, what did he say about your zinc copper ratio or your calcium potassium ratio? Or did he inquire as to whether or not you had any mercury affecting your thyroid? Or did he talk about reverse T3 or T4? He said, no, the man didn't say anything about any of that. Well, it's the, he's a... Uh, <laughs> Most medical doctors are very good at understanding thyroid from the viewpoint of hormone levels in the blood. Now, for any, any people out there who took biology and biochemistry, you, you studied something called the Krebs cycle in school, and you studied something else called the electron transport chain. When you're dealing with the thyroid hormone, the thyroid hormone enters the electron transport chain, and it is the hormone undergoes certain changes. One of the major changes you get with thyroid hormone is it's converted from T4 to T3. And in order for that conversion to take place, you have to have a balance of other hormones, that, which is a correct balance. And you also have to have certain trace, uh, trace minerals that enable that to occur. Those trace minerals become coenzymes in helping this transformation to occur. Then when you hit the cell, the sensitivity of your cells to thyroid hormones depend on a ratio of zinc to copper and calcium to potassium. And, it, and for, you, for the medical doctors out there who are listening to me or think, thinking I don't know what I'm talking about, go pick up Guyton's Physiology book. Now, Guyton's Physiology is a book, that's the Bible of physiology. Pick up Guyton's Physiology and look up where Guyton talks about how calcium and potassium in some way, he said, not fully known at this time, act as both a act as either a receptor or a governor against thyroid function. In other words, what Guyton, Guyton was saying that potassium in your cells sensitizes your tissues to the effects 
of thyroid hormones, Mm -hmm. while calcium desensitizes. And the reason why that exists is because if you went one extreme to the other, you'd either have the thyroid hormone overrunning your body and being making you go hyperthyroid, or you would be hypothyroid. So there's hypo and hyperthyroid based on the hormone levels, but then there's also hypo and hyperthyroid based on the cell receptor levels. And the only way you can understand that is that you can't understand that by a blood test because the blood test isn't telling you the level of the, of the mineral in your cell. Mm-hmm. It's telling you what the, what the mineral of the level in your blood is, and the blood is a means of transportation. The cell is a, is a, is a storage site. Mm-hmm. So in order to understand how your thyroid hormone is working in your cells, you've got to look at a tissue. And the easiest one to look at is hair, which is why we use hair analysis. You look at the ratios between calcium and potassium in your hair and zinc and copper, and then you have an understanding of how well your body is responding to the thyroid hormone and how well you're actually utilizing it. Then also, if you see your mercury or your arsenic is high, you know that those metals are down-regulating your thyroid hormones. Mm -hmm. And the stuff in tap water as well. (laughs) Oh, yeah, exactly. Of course. Yeah, exactly. So this is why we have this other website about thyroid is because thyroid and candida are very heavily related. There are some doctors out there who've told me that they don't believe that Hashimoto's occurs outside of a candida patient. They believe everyone with Hashimoto's has candida and leaky gut. Now, I, I think that's a bit extreme because there are maybe some other conditions environmental conditions which would also cause it, but they have a, they have a good point. It, it's more prevalent in... In candida patients and patients with leaky gut, Hash, uh, Hashimoto's is. It so when you sense. when you when you draw back to reveal a little bit, you find that that a lot of what um, functional medical doctors and and functional nutritionists like myself, what we're really doing is a term that was that was used years ago, which kind of died off, but it's called clinical ecology. Mm-hmm. This is what a lot of us are actually in reality doing. It's clinical ecology. We're looking at the environment and how the environment and different infections and toxins in the environment affects this person and their health from a clinical standpoint. Oh, I love it. I love it. I love it. I love it. So it sounds like your program could take about two years. Is that, does that sound Yes, about that's right? a very good, that's very possible. And, and of course, people get upset hearing about that because they read advertisements on the internet, let's say for different products like 3 Lack and all these things, which claim they get rid of your candida in a couple of weeks. And you've got to be careful because that's false advertising. They, mm-hmm. they, don't, they don't have any proof that they're getting rid of. You take the product and you feel better. That's not proof your candida is gone. That's only proof you feel better. <laughs> what happens when you stop taking the product? How do you, and then you feel bad again. Well, 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 that's because you needed to continue to take it. Now, that starts to get into the same, the same fallacy and, and the same um, kind of racket that you have with psychiatric drugs. Um, I, while I, since I just said that, I, I will f- uh, further say that most of the mass shootings, when you go and you analyze the people who have done all these mass shootings, mm-hmm. most of them were on psychiatric drugs and now withdrawing from them. And if you study the actual data, you find out that when people try to withdraw from psychiatric drugs, their symptoms go wild. Mm-hmm. So, just, so just as a side note. It is so this it is it is so painful to see how many people are suffering and they go to their doctor, they say they're depressed with the anxiety and they're put on meds and the meds have a, a worse, a worse uh, experience with the meds. I, my beautiful neighbor was murdered by a man and it was, I mean, just terrifying. He was, she was murdered by a man who, who had recently been put on drugs and once they, they put him in the jail with the, the, the psychiatric prison and they got him balanced got him off the drugs or whatever and he says i have no idea why i did it i they put him on these drugs and he started having obsessive thoughts about killing people and he goes and he 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 claimed guilty he's spending the rest of his life in prison but he would absolutely did not understand why he did it and he was put on a bunch of new new to the market drugs i'm not saying that's the cause all the time but it's just we see this like you said you look at people who do these violent acts and you see a lot of times they're also on drugs and we just there's got to be a better way this is this is something i'd be happy to come back oh, to the show to and we can talk about this exclusively because i 
I've, I've made it a hobby in the last 30 years to get people off psychiatric medications by handling the real problems that they have in their body, looking for the real physical problems. See, psychiatrists, when they prescribe these drugs, they really don't fully understand how the drug is going to work and how it's going to work in combination. And when they talk about a chemical imbalance in the brain, there's absolutely no proof that it exists. There's ne no one has ever proven with any test that a chemical imbalance exists. Oh my gosh. It's never been proven. If you go out and look for it, you're never going to find it. There's no proof. It's a, it's a, it's a t it's a word that's been th or a phrase that's been thrown around and it's been marketed. Psychiatry and the and the whole field of psychiatric drugs is one of the most amazing marketing scams you've ever seen in your life. How it works is incredible. There's a video people can find which is called Marketing Madness. Marketing madness. You look for that video. It's rather lengthy, but it's incredible in how it explains and gives you all the actual proof ab about how this whole thing is just like one big racket. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you, they don't know. They have no clue what they're doing. Psy psychiatrists are probably the most inept out of any group of professionals. They have the lowest SAT scores. They have the highest rate of suicide. They have the highest rate of committing felonies and other mm. crimes. And that's not my opinion. That came out of the LA Times in 1988 when they did a special on psychiatry. But anyway, rather than wasting our time on them, I let's go back love, to the main point. Yes, I'd love to have you back. We, I know you are pressed for time and we only have a few more minutes. And uh, I wanted to um, make sure that we understand how we can get on your program. I also wanted to uh, field a few of the questions from the listeners. So you, you talked about these these different products, these binders and all these different products. It, it Your program is really individualized. So someone comes and works with you. You can perform telemedicine or do they have have to come see you in person no we don't see anyone in person anymore we do everything uh via the internet so so you can order the labs or tell them to get their doctor to order these labs it, therefore they could be covered some of these labs could be covered by their insurance some yes some but mostly the the lab tests are either self um like i would guess you would call it a, a home test that i've developed mm -hmm. so it's a it's a self test they do at home on their own urine or they can contact one of the labs online and have the kit sent to their house and they can then collect a hair sample a urine sample a saliva sample a stool sample or whatever is needed the only time that we ever need a doctor is if they need a blood test for anything mm -hmm. so the testing everything is basically done online and right right in the person right with them at home it's very easy Fantastic. And what is the best? I know you have a few websites. What is the best website for those who want to uh, get on your program? Probably, well, I'd say it's it's either health-truth.com or it would be the New York City uh, Yeast Doctor. Okay, dot com. And we'll, of course, have all those links uh, in the show notes of today's podcast at learntruehealth.com. So we've got a lot of questions from the listeners um, sure. in the Facebook group. Okay, so Desiree says, I'm super excited to hear the protocol. So good. You, you already heard the protocol because we talked about it for kicking candida and uh, heavy metal detox. She, her, she has three questions. Which would work first, heavy metal or candida? It sounds like you handle candida and then heavy metal. Yeah, you have to because if you if you handle heavy metals first, drawing those metals out, some of them you urinate out, some of them you go out go out in your poop, and when they go out in your poop, they have to go through your intestinal tract, and the candida absorbs them. So you always have to handle candida first before heavy metals. There's a very famous doctor out in the Midwest who's been preaching for years that you have to handle the mercury first. And I thank him for that because he has sent me so many patients inadvertently oh. who couldn't handle it. They would come to me as if they're Dr. Biamonte. He, I, everything he said made sense. But when I went on the piss treatment, I couldn't handle it. My candida was going insane. And so that's how I learned not to do it that way. That's how I actually learned that was the wrong way to do it. I listened to what the patients were telling me. And then I looked, I sat back and I looked at it from the, uh, from the viewpoint of the textbooks in terms of how metals affect these organisms, that it made sense. Mm. 
I, I love it. I love that you figured so much of this out and we get to benefit from your years and years of expertise. Uh, her next question, what can we do for kids that have this? Can they also go through this program? Oh, yeah. The kids go through the same program. It's just that it's a little different for kids. Some of the products you use are not as potent, but it's the same concept. Kids have to go through this, uh, the program w w using the same concepts, not necessarily the same products and the same doses, but it's the same concept. Mm -hmm. And in the last uh, part one of, of this interview series, uh, we did discuss symptoms to look for to know whether you have candida or not. And of course, you could order Dr. Bimonti's uh, urine test to determine whether you do have a candida issue. Her third question is, does candida have a direct correlation to allergies? Yes, it does. Absolutely. Um, pa patients with candida will notice that when their candida is worse, their allergy is worse. And they'll especially, uh, very interestingly, notice that when they have die-off, their allergies get worse. And it's, it's all this, basically the same mechanism that's going on. It's all the same mechanism. But the funny thing is, from birth, you'll find that kids who are born with a lot of allergies, who are born with eczema, who are born with asthma, these are kids who are born with candida. Candida is the underlying reason why they have these problems. Mm. And by clearing it up, uh, we see that do allergies go away after yes, like, as, they, they asthma go from away. allergies go away? Allergies go away when you because an allergy is from a hyperactive immune system. People think mm -hmm. allergy, my immune system is weak. No, it's not. It's hyperactive. It's hypervigil. Mm -hmm. So, you, and it, one of the reasons why it's that way is because it's dealing with candida all the time. So, when you get the candida out of the out of the uh, com, the computation, the uh, the immune system, and it's the balance between the thymus gland and the adrenal glands. There's any good nutritionist or acupuncturist or chiropractor is going to know this, that when, how you're handling allergies ultimately is by balancing or rebalancing the adrenal and thymus. Most doctors don't think the thymus does anything past the age of two or three years old. Huh. But that's, that's not true. The thymus makes a hormone called thymosin, which is still active and still doing things well into your, into your years. So there is thymus involution that occurs. As you get older and your adrenals become more active, your thymus does shrink a bit, but the thymus is still there doing something. It's not like your, uh, your tonsils that you, know, you just remove or something like this. <laughs> Sandy asks if you have experience with, and I, I hope I pronounce this right, uh, C. cruci candida with a K, K-R-U-S-E-I. Yeah, there are, there are diff many different strains of candida. The, what you need to know about them is some of them have evolved and become drug resistive because these strains have been exposed to repeated pharmaceuticals like nystatin and some other drugs. Ultimately, there is no difference in, uh, between any of these strains as far as I'm concerned. Any of these, any strains of candida, whether it's Tropicalis, Crucia, Galbrata, whatever the strain is, we, we kill it all the same. There's only, only, I will say, of interest. There are some Japanese strains of candida which are very interesting because they're able to produce huge amounts of alcohol in the person's body mm. to the point where the person could actually be legally intoxicated. Oh, my gosh. But even that candida can be killed. But it is noteworthy that those strains exist. They're, they are interesting. I've seen a few episodes like House, you know, or those, you know, kind of MD TV shows where they have a patient that's chronically drunk and it turns out it's in their gut that they, they love doing that as a plot because it's, it's amusing. Uh, but though all these candidas will die in your program is what you're saying. Yes, I am. I should probably be serving 20, 20 lifetimes in jail for killing candida over and over again. <laughs> Uh, now, there's several listeners, so I'll just group it all together, there's several listeners who are so excited and they're saying they have irritated, patchy eczema lesions all in their body uh, and they wonder uh, what is the um, connection between these and one of them said that, that they started appearing on their body after qu several courses of antibiotics and they wonder if, if uh, there's a correlation between eczema and candida. Eczema is caused by candida and leaky gut. I had eczema as a child. I didn't really stably get rid of my eczema until I finally handled my the candida I had, my own imbalance in my flora. Although when I did it on myself, I did it backwards because I hadn't evolved this technology yet. I did it the hard way. But guaranteed, candida is the cause of eczema. Well, that I mean, that is saying something because right here we've talked about two uh, conditions that are um, autoimmune in nature. Go, have, have everyone go online, 
to go online, go on Google, do a search for candida and eczema and take a look at how many documents you end up pulling up. Mm. There's a listener who talks about her tongue that is always coated. Um, and she she wonders if it's candida, even though she scrapes it. She's wondering, is this candida? Her tongue is always just covered in something. There's a condition called thrush, which typically happens in AIDS and latter stages of cancer where the candida starts to grow in your mouth. The American Indians used to call it furry tongue. Your, your mouth and your tongue become furry and white looking. Your tongue is very painful. It's very hard to swallow. It's very painful. That's, have, that's called thrush and that's having live candida growing in your mouth. That's a different condition than I believe what this lady is talking about. Have, simply having a coated tongue very often comes about due to your sinuses having a constant drip Mm. or having having allergies or having some or if you have candida your tongue can be coated from the candida in your intestinal tract causing the mucus to form in your mouth mm. there there are two different things but those are the two explanations for that one one is the extreme which is thrush and the other we would just simply uh, mark uh, like let's say it's dysbiosis or it actually could be a sinus problem uh, there's a there's a great test you can get nowadays it's a sinus culture that identifies in your sinuses whether or not you have marcons and, and um, biofilm there. And that's very, I very often see that, that condition in these people with the tongue type of issue, that they have, they have marcons, marcons in their sinus with biofilm and even yeast, and that's what's causing their tongue to get co covered. It's not the actual infection, it's the fact that the, the immune system and the body is creating mucus there to try to protect itself from the irritation of these microbes. How would you go about helping the person get rid of those microbes in the sinus? Would the um, these antiparasitics and antifungals that they take on your program um, help uh, remove that from the sinus? Yeah, they they do, but we also give them very specific, uh, specific localized treatments using different sinus products that are available now that kill all those bad bugs there. Love it. And then my final question is uh, female yeast infections, and uh, like vaginal yeast infections. Uh, is How similar is that to a colon uh, candida infection? Would going through this whole protocol uh, also help a woman to balance her body so to no longer have chronic uh, vaginal yeast infections? Per the Merck Manual, which is a book that should be in every physician's library, you do not treat chronic vaginal yeast infections without concurrently treating the yeast infection in the colon. Women who only treat ye vaginal yeast never get better unless it's just a, a flippant one-time yeast infection. Any woman who has chronic vaginal yeast infections has candida overgrowth in her colon and her intestine just like all the other candida patients. And she's never going to get rid of the vaginal yeast infection until she stops worrying about the vaginal area and starts treating her whole body meaning her colon and her small intestine. It's never going to happen. Uh, it was such a blast having you on the show today and having you back. And I can't wait to have you again to talk about um, getting people off of psychiatric uh, medications. And that, that is just going to be such a great rabbit hole to, to go un down under. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm so excited for that one. Um, I'm thrilled that we brought this information to the listeners because it sounds like a lot of people who suffer chronically for years and years – have a candida infection in their gut and then it, 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 it's this grouping of things it's it's like lyme disease is not just one thing they they often find there's all these co-infections and it's a co-environment sounds like candida is the same thing it becomes this ecosystem that supports this ongoing chronic infection and you help to break it apart and then support the body in creating that new ecosystem that is inhospitable to candida and i thank you so much for the work that you do and thank you for coming on the show and sharing with us is there, is there anything you'd like to say to wrap up today's interview lyme disease what happens in many patients with lyme is they actually become cured by their doctors but they don't believe it because they still have symptoms they associate with Lyme. And those symptoms are now candida. This is, this is there, there are, interestingly enough, there are two conditions nowadays which are interesting to consider in this light. One is COVID. COVID causes candida. The COVID vaccine causes candida. And treatments for Lyme disease cause candida. 
So many, this thing you're hearing about long COVID, very often long COVID is just simply somebody who's now developed candida as a result of having COVID. And the same thing was true, these people with Lyme disease who were going around saying none of the tests really work. They're saying that because they had, they had Lyme, they were treated for Lyme, they tested for Lyme, it showed the Lyme improved greatly or was gone, but they still had symptoms that they think are from Lyme. Those symptoms are now from the antibiotics they took that caused candida because they took the antibiotics to get rid of Lyme. Very yeah. simple. Oh my gosh. I mean, that that just that's hundreds of thousands of people right there who yes. are suffering and uh, suffering and suffering and suffering. Thank you so much. I I I hope I hope we help so many people today with the information that you're that you're providing with us. And can't wait to have you back on the show. This has been wonderful. Thank you. You're more than welcome. Wasn't that a fantastic interview with Dr. Biamonte? Uh, aren't you just on fire and want to share this with all your friends? I know I am definitely going to be sharing this. I've already, the second I was finished this interview, I started texting some of my friends, telling my friends how excited I was for them to hear this because I know just how much this interview is going to make a difference in so many people's lives. I'd be remiss if I didn't let you know about a resource that um, I have found invaluable, and that is TakeYourSupplements.com. Uh, when you go to that website, it's very simple. You put in your information, and Jennifer Saltzman, who's the head health coach there, I've been working with her for over 10 years. We've become very good friends. It's Those supplements are designed by the naturopathic physician that helped me to heal and reverse, to no longer have polycystic ovarian syndrome, chronic adrenal fatigue, uh, type 2 diabetes, and infertility. He helped me to resolve all those issues. And Jennifer Salzman has been trained, uh, as have I, in his protocols. But when you go to takeyoursupplements.com, you put in your information, and, and the two of you get to have a phone call together. And she will help you based on, there's a, a set of, of questions we go through that determine what mineral deficiencies you have or what nutrient deficiencies you have. She's also an, an expert in helping people to get, especially those who are like, have had to eliminate, have a lot of food sensitivities, have had to eliminate a lot of foods, who have uh, symptoms like Lyme disease or sim sim digestive issues, um, uh, bloating or uh, heartburn, you know, just the, the really frustrating, uh, constant gnawing digestive issues. She's been fantastic at helping people to, to strengthen the digestive system and to strengthen the immune system. She's also fantastic at helping people with chronic pain. Those are her areas of expertise. But she's been trained by these naturopathic physicians that have created these protocols and also designed these supplements. And my favorite being their mineral supplements are the most bioavailable mineral supplements I've ever found. And they've made such a huge difference for me. So if you've like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm thinking like I just need to add more trace minerals to my life or you keep hearing about how important it is to have not only just magnesium, but have all 60 minerals or 77 trace minerals and elements in your body, in your life, because our food is really void of minerals. They don't remineralize the soil in in uh, large agriculture and so unless you yourself are growing your own food and you know you've remineralized your soil then you're not you're not getting all the minerals you need so go ahead and just go to takeyoursupplements.com put in your information she's amazing at working with people really just very understanding and she quickly goes through a list of the symptoms you have, and then she helps you to determine what supplements you need that are within your budget. They're dosed by body weight. So it's a very specific protocol. And then you follow up with her and, and she, you don't, you, a lot of practitioners out there will just like, you just drop off into nothing where she will follow up with you and help you along your path. So I absolutely love Jennifer Saltzman at TakeYourSupplements.com and she's helped so many of the listeners. In fact, if you go to the Learn True Health Facebook group, you will see a lot of testimonials there. You can use the search function in the Facebook group and you'll see testimonials there of people who have shared how much she has made a difference in their healing process. So a lot of times we're deficient in, uh, in key nutrients and we always think about vitamins but really, minerals are the hardest thing to secure, and I just love their liquid uh, trace minerals that are in such a way that the body can readily absorb them, even people with uh, chronic 
uh, absorption issues because they're in a, such an ionic uh, state that the body can readily uptake them. And that was my experience when I started taking those minerals years ago. I immediately felt the, see, I had this gnawing hunger all the time because my blood sugar was out of control and I was exhausted. And in one day, the first day of taking the supplements, the, the trace minerals, I noticed that my gnawing hunger went away. And within five days of taking the supplements, my energy came back. And that was, I had, I had really bad chronic fatigue and I had really bad out of control blood sugar. And those within the, the first five days feeling such a difference, it was amazing. In less than three months, my diabetes was completely gone. And of course I did dietary changes as well. But the thing is, you can't out supplement a bad diet. So you always have to make you know, really good positive changes to your diet. But at the same time, you can't eat your way to enough minerals given conventionally grown food. It's just not possible. So most people out there are nutrient deficient in certain key minerals. And that's why I love the takeyoursupplements.com. I love, they love their minerals and I love the work that Jen's doing. So check them out. They also have a 30-day money-back guarantee, which I only ever recommend companies or products that I believe in that make a dif difference for me, that have made a difference for other listeners, and that also will stand behind their products uh, to make sure that that they are legitimate and that they are their, their priorities and their ethics are there to support you in your health success. So I'm proud of that as well. Awesome. Thank you so much for being a listener. Thank you so much for sharing this show with those you care about. Come join the Facebook group and share your testimonials. I'd love to hear you and I'd love to see you there.